Of all the Easy Company men portrayed in the Band of Brothers series, Roy W. Cobb would have to be the most obscure of them all. Outside of a few documented incidents written by other Easy veterans, nothing is known for sure about Cobb which lends the question, why was he so focused on in the series? Roy Cobb was possibly born in June 1914, though this is largely a guess after searching through death notices of the name and linking the most probable age at the time. Even then, he would have been 28 when he joined Easy Company, which would have made him possibly the oldest enlisted man in the company, if not the regiment. Even trying to find an actual photo of Roy Cobb borders on the impossible. If you Google his name, you end up with everyone from Eugene Rowe to a Bollywood actress. What makes it so difficult is that his family has not made his service record available. Therefore, anything written about him outside of veterans' memoirs is unreliable. This is most likely a photo of Cobb. His middle name has been listed as Wilson on one site, but the grave states his birth year as 1915, and the burial site is in California, where other sources state he died in New York. That photo, incidentally, was cut from this Easy Company group photo, but as the identification seems to originate from a Band of Brothers wiki fan site, I wouldn't be taking bets on it. The other photo claiming to be Roy is this one, but the source comes from TikTok. I can't say for sure if the two men are the same. If all of that is not complicated enough, his story starts to get even murkier. Stephen Ambrose in the book quotes Roy Cobb as being an old soldier with nine years service. According to Ambrose, he landed with the 1st Armored Division in Africa, where he took part in Operation Torch in November 1942. He was evacuated after contracting yellow jaundice, but the troop ship he was on was torpedoed and he was transferred to a destroyer for the remainder of the trip back to the States. If the story is true, and again, I don't know how it can be verified when there is no service record, he may be the only member of the 101st Airborne Division to have participated in both a sea and airborne landing. What is obviously a problem with the story is by November 1942, when Cobb was in Africa, Easy Company had already left Takoa, and by the time Cobb had swum back to the States, the 506th would have already been at Camp Mac Call, or even moved on to Kentucky, mid-1943. As he couldn't have been in two places at once, and likely wasn't on loan to the 1st Division to take part in Torch, he either wasn't in North Africa, or he wasn't with Easy Company until just prior to them being shipped out to England. Stephen Ambrose seems to be the only source of the information, which apparently came from a David Webster letter. To my knowledge, the actor who played him in the series, Craig Heaney, has never breathed a word about the man he portrayed, or even the series itself. On the website Together We Serve, Cobb is listed as serving with the 1st Armored Division from 1941 to 1943, as well as fighting in Torch in 1942. He then joined the 101st in 1943. As the 506th only officially became part of the 101st in June 1943, Cobb would have joined them not long before the regiment left for the disembarkation point in New York. If Cobb was able to take his qualifying jumps to earn his jump wings, then I suppose it's possible. But the timeline is very tight, and I have never been aware of new recruits coming into the regiment that late in proceedings. The only thing for sure is that Roy Cobb was a member of Easy Company on or before June 6, 1944. We will follow his journey through Band of Brothers, as there is a lot more detail of him in the series than there is in the real form. Stephen Ambrose's book does feature Cobb at different times, but the majority of the detail comes from David Webster's own book, Parachute Infantry. Webster was part of Cobb's platoon in Hagano. Even though Webster was an original member of Easy since Tacoa, his book frustratingly starts with his jump into Normandy. Webster's family had contacted Stephen Ambrose after his death to get his diary published. Ambrose used Webster's notes to not only publish Parachute Infantry, but used a lot of the information in his own book, Band of Brothers. As Webster micro-analyzed the day-to-day -day happenings in his platoon, his account of the earlier days of the company would have been interesting.
During the drop into Normandy on the 6th of June 1944, Cobb was hit by flak inside the C-47. George Luz, who was in Cobb's stick, had related the story that he exchanged jump positions with Cobb because Luz was carrying a radio and a lot of extra weight, so wanted to be closer to the door. Harry Welsh, who was the jump master on the flight, asked Cobb if he could stand up, to which Cobb said no. Welsh told him to remain on the plane. After recovering in England, Cobb rejoined Easy Company on their return to Aldbourne. In episode four of Band of Brothers Replacements, Roy Cobb is quickly turned into the most unpopular enlisted man in the company when he starts hassling the replacements for wearing the presidential unit citation for their achievements in Normandy. Denver Bull Randleman then shoots back at Cobb by reminding him that he didn't take part in Normandy neither. I find this scene to be an insult to both Cobb and Randleman. A paratrooper would very unlikely criticize another man, replacement or not, for wearing a unit citation. And there is no way Randleman would tell Cobb he didn't fight in Normandy when he was wounded by anti-aircraft fire before he could jump. These guys were brothers and elite soldiers, and although replacements might have received a cold reception, they were not cast aside or disrespected. They would need to fight beside and trust one another during the combat ahead. I really resent Tom Hanks and co preaching about how they needed to get the men's stories right, but then making up stories to create drama. As the series went on, Cobb became more objectionable, but outside of an incident toward the end of the war, which we will get to shortly, there is no record of him being belligerent or unpleasant toward any of his fellow company members. Ambrose wrote that Cobb was tall, lean, and invariably good-natured. Not much is known of Cobb's time in Holland during Market Garden, as Webster does not mention him once during the operation. They were obviously in different platoons. As Webster was wounded at the back end of Holland, Cobb's time in Bastogne is also a mystery. Ambrose does not write about him again until they arrive in Hagenau, France, in January 1945. The series, however, had Cobb smugly telling the replacements how to wear their equipment prior to the jump and fighting at Noonan with a grease gun before ending up in a stressed state at the conclusion of the battle. I have no doubt that the entire portrayal of Roy Cobb before and in Holland was dramatized. Roy Cobb's story really only comes to light when Easy Company arrives in the relative rest area of Hagenau, France. The writers, Eric Bork and Bruce McKenna, really made a meal of this episode if they were attempting to get the story even remotely close to historical fact. The story of David Webster, who was the main focus of the episode, was a total mess despite the period being extensively covered in his book. This will be covered in a future video. Despite Cobb being involved in one of the more serious events within Easy Company itself during the entire war, the writers chose to run with a different story, which was completely fabricated. It is likely that Cobb was portrayed as an outsider in the replacements episode as a lead up to the last patrol. David Webster was in Roy Cobb's platoon in Hagenau and speaks of him constantly in his memoirs during this time. As Webster's book is a tedious account of what they were eating from day to day and which officer he disliked the most, there isn't a great deal of interesting history to come out of it. As a highly educated individual, I feel that Webster would not have agreed to have his war diary published in its raw form. For the most part, Cobb was just another member of the platoon who did as everyone else did without too much complaining. He was chosen to take part in the famous patrol. Contrary to the series, Donald Malarkey was not in Webster's or Cobb's platoon, Rather, it was a sergeant named McGreary. Trouble started on the night of the patrol when Cobb and another trooper, Wiseman, had discovered bottles of schnapps in an abandoned house and had started fighting amongst themselves after heavy drinking. At the commencement of the patrol, the rubber boat Cobb had been in capsized and as he was about to attempt to swim across the creek, Lieutenant Henry Jones, the patrol leader, according to Webster, had ordered him to return to the OP. A wounded German had been left on the opposite bank, and his moaning and groaning was getting on the nerves of the men. Just before sunrise, Cobb crawled down to the creek and threw a grenade across, 
killing the man. What happened next was inexplicably not mentioned in Webster's book, even though he would have been present. It's possible that the entries were missing or lost. The account comes from Stephen Ambrose, who doesn't mention the source. Cobb, following the patrol was still drunk on schnapps, had gotten into an argument with Private Robert Marsh, who was also in their platoon. Lieutenant Foley, who was leader of the first platoon, separated the two men and started to reprimand Cobb, who was off limits, disobeying orders, and being drunk and disorderly. Cobb lost his cool and began mouthing off at Foley before charging at him. Two men grabbed Cobb and took him to ground. Sergeant Martin, who was also present, pulled his 45, but was told to holster his weapon. Foley had Cobb arrested and taken to regiment for lockup. Foley later wrote up the court-martial for Cobb. When he took the papers to sink, he told Foley he could have saved them all a lot of time if he had have shot him. Wiseman, the other man involved in the fight, was also court-martialed for being drunk and disorderly. There have been many versions of this story, including Cobb striking Foley and pulling a gun on him, but it appears as though it did not get any more serious, as was described by Ambrose, as Cobb was apparently permitted to remain with the company through Germany and Austria. This photo of Easy Company, which I show often, was taken in Austria, so it proves Cobb was still in the company. According to Clancy Lyle, Cobb was given to him to care for as he knew Cobb best. Roy was an okay guy. He was a good soldier when he wasn't drinking. But if there was a bottle in the middle of the German HQ, he would go out and get it. That was his problem. As a combat guy, he was quite good. No question about that, Lyle stated in his biography Silver Eagle. He also said Cobb never moaned about not being promoted. Roy Cobb received a general discharge at the end of the war. It's not clear what he did in civilian life, and he seems to have passed away in New York in 1990. In my opinion, the series was unfair to the memory of Roy Cobb. He was portrayed as an arrogant bully and bitter man, whereas apart from the incident with Lieutenant Foley very late in the war, was as good a soldier as anyone else in Easy. I have also not ever heard any of the veterans complain about Cobb. What do you think of Roy W. Cobb? Was he made out to be a bad guy just to fill that role, or was the incident with Foley a sign of his attitude? Please leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the content, please subscribe and don't forget to click that thumbs up button as well.